Since posting our video on CRTs almost two years ago, we've had a lot of questions and interest in the topic. Some people wondered, how do you connect modern devices to a CRT? Are there really benefits to using one these days? And what's up with display resolutions on a CRT? With this in mind, I wanted to discuss it once again, while also showcasing the venerable Sony FW900 CRT monitor running the latest games on PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. It's neat to see, of course. Seeing such modern titles on a display like this is not a usual thing. But there's more. It will also help us illustrate some of the talking points I've presented around CRTs in general. First though, I'm not here to tell you to ditch your flat panel display for a CRT. That really doesn't make sense in most cases. This is really more of an observation of the technology and kind of a closer look at what makes it such a unique and special type of display. Now, of course, naturally, when discussing CRTs these days, most people tend to think of them in regards to retro games, specifically playing old console games on a CRT television. It's a fantastic use case and something I regularly use myself, specifically with older consoles, including the PlayStation, Super NES, Sega Mega Drive, and basically anything else before the HDMI era. It's perfect for this. Now, I use a professional broadcast monitor, of course, but even a consumer set will get the job done. It's a great way to play these classic games. But CRTs were used for so much more, including the PC, of course. And yeah, I've showcased this as well in some of my retro PC videos. And part of the reason why it works so well with old computer games ties into why it's still so interesting today. Specifically, they offer a lot of additional flexibility in terms of resolution support and refresh rates. And the way that these things are presented drastically changes the perceptual image quality compared to any flat panel out there. So for this video then, obviously, I've attached the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X to this monitor. It looks great, right? And of course, one of the first questions always asked when showing such a thing is, how the heck do you do it? After all, these consoles use HDMI, but monitors like this do not have HDMI inputs. Well, in this case, it's as simple as finding an HDMI to VGA adapter like this one. Now, of course, this one itself is limited in that it maxes out at 1080p 60, but there are other solutions out there. If you want to use a monitor like this with your PC, though, I would recommend a better DisplayPort or USB-C style adapter, which can support the higher resolutions and refresh rates this monitor is capable of. Remember, the FW900 can support resolutions above 1440p at refresh rates higher than 60. That's pretty darn impressive for a monitor from the early 2000s. And that makes sense, because the FW900 itself was a professional monitor released during this period. It wasn't intended for just the average consumer necessarily, so its support and features is higher than that. But everything I say still can be applied to any old PC monitor. They just may not support the higher resolutions and features that this one does. So keep that in mind. So this is where my first sort of discussion point comes into play, specifically around resolution and the way that your eyes perceive it. What do I mean by this? Well, first we need to consider the flat panel. Any flat panel, really. LCD, OLED, plasma, anything like this. These monitors use a fixed grid with a defined native resolution, if you will. A 4K monitor, for instance, will have 3840 by 2160 worth of pixels, with each pixel composed of individual sub-pixels. This matrix of pixels can be addressed digitally, enabling a pixel-perfect display as long as you're sending an image that matches the resolution of the panel. And this is where the entire concept of native resolution comes into play in the first place. If you display anything other than the native pixel resolution of the monitor, you're going to need to upscale and interpolate the image to fit the screen. Now the monitor itself can obviously do this processing, but there's other software solutions that can occur as well. And the entire point is to achieve maximum image quality while targeting that native resolution of the panel. This is why if the input resolution is lower than the panel's own resolution, you wind up with a blurred image as the individual pixels no longer properly align to the grid. The basic interpolation performed by most monitors simply produces a blurrier result. This is where all the discussion around resolution really stems from. A higher resolution is always a good thing, CRT or not, 
But the reason it's so desirable on these monitors is that you want to match your output resolution to the pixel resolution, otherwise you're going to wind up with interpolation blur. And that is something we want to avoid. But this is where it gets interesting, and where CRTs are fundamentally different. Now, at its core, these displays use an electron gun situated at the neck of the tube, the beams of which are directed by an anode towards the front of the tube. The electrons fired from this electron gun then pass through a mesh, such as a shadow mask or aperture grill, before striking a phosphor-coated screen, which in turn lights up the different colored phosphors to form the final image. So while factors such as the precision of the mesh do determine the maximum fidelity and essentially the highest resolution, if you will, the end result to the eye is very different to what you get with a matrix of pixel elements in a fixed pixel display. Now, of course, this is a very simplistic way to describe it, of course. What this basically means is that up to the maximum supported resolution of the CRT, any resolution below that can be displayed on this monitor without the side effects that we get on flat panel displays. So if you display, say, 720p on a monitor like the FW900, it still looks great. It doesn't have the typical upscale blur because it's fundamentally not treating that image in the same way. You can throw up any resolution you like within the supported list and they will all look great. So while there is technically a ceiling to the amount of detail you can display on one of these monitors, the key advantage here is that many resolutions look great. Again though, I stress, higher resolutions on a CRT are still superior to lower resolutions. The point here is that it just handles those lower resolutions better. Here's a fun example that I tried using Ratchet and Clank on PlayStation 5. This first image is close up to the screen filmed with my camera, a Panasonic GH5. Now, what we're seeing here is a 1080p 60Hz output to the CRT, right? Now, let's bring in this other side here. As you can see now, it looks a little different. It's not quite as sharp, but it still looks clean. What are we looking at here? Well, this is 720p. Now, of course, the PS5 is still downscaling from its higher resolution, the internal resolution, I should note, but what we're sending to the screen still looks good in both cases. But what about something like, say, the Nintendo Switch, which has a lot of low-resolution games? Now, these really can struggle on a large 4K flat panel screen. They often appear extremely blurry and undefined on such a display. But if we connect it to the FW900, even at something like 720p or lower, the resulting image is still surprisingly clean and attractive. So that's really kind of my point here. The nature of how CRTs work fundamentally alters how you perceive image quality on such a display. This is something I feel we've lost in the shift to flat panels. A lot of R&D work, though, has been poured into overcoming the limitations of using a fixed pixel display, mind you. I mean, that's the entire point behind reconstruction techniques. You want to send 4K to a 4K monitor and then have the software try to make up the pixels to overcome the issues. But if you could just say display 1440p or any other arbitrary resolution below 4K on such a monitor without any of the upscale blur and you just got that native look of the pixels, it would be a whole lot better, wouldn't it? And the whole argument around resolution would change significantly. We'd still prefer higher pixel counts, but it wouldn't be as big of a deal if it's below that. Then of course there's the motion handling, and this is something else that Rich and I discussed a lot in that first video. It's still true today, but things have changed a little since then. Okay, so normally, without any sort of image pulsing or blanking out of the display, a sample and hold panel, which is what pretty much all flat panels, save for plasmas, use, uh, you will inherently lose detail while on-screen elements are moving. This is especially bad in side-scrolling games. I mean, the whole thing just becomes kind of a mess as you're moving through the game world. I don't love it. Now, even with the fast response times of something like an OLED screen, the sample and hold nature of it ensures that blurring still occurs. Look at this UFO from Blurbusters, and you kind of see what I mean. This is actually pretty consistent with what you see. You lose a lot of information as this thing scrolls across the screen. Now, if we display the same test on the FW900 and freeze the image, it's crystal clear. In fact, there's just a small ghost artifact due to the camera, but in general, all of the detail is maintained because it is there. It looks perfect in motion. And this is just at 60 hertz, right? 
That's why 60 hertz looks so good on these screens. If you turn up the refresh rate in a PC game, though, it looks even better. But this is where things like black frame insertion and other comparable methods kind of come into play. I'd used this before with an older light boost monitor, and I've tested the black frame insertion feature on LG's older OLEDs, such as the C8. But starting with the CX series of OLEDs, the fast response time of OLED is combined with sort of pulsing the screen uh, using black frame insertion to create an effect that essentially eliminates all motion blur. So yeah, it actually matches the clarity of a CRT in motion, finally. I've talked about this in many videos and it's true. The downside to this though is that it dims the image since you're displaying black for a period of time. It's literally flashing the screen rapidly as you play. This also causes some additional flicker at 60 Hz. Still, overall, this is great news as display manufacturers are finally overcoming this inherent flaw in these displays. I'm so happy to see it, and there's a lot more happening as well in the PC space on this front too, so let's keep an eye on that. But that's really just scratching the surface of this whole thing. There is a lot of research and a lot of technology going on to try to overcome this sample and hold blur problem. Blurbusters has a lot more on this, so check out that site. Now, even still, there is something unique about the way a phosphor screen looks in motion. It's just, there's this crispness to it that's just hard to explain. You've got to see this in person to fully appreciate what it brings to the table. Of course, there's other elements to the CRT to consider as well. It still has excellent contrast. In fact, while OLED can technically get darker, uh, the CRT just has this amazing quality within the near black region. So things that are rich in shadow and just barely visible really shine on a CRT in a way that maybe on an OLED you lose a little bit of detail that you would like to see or encounter some additional posterization. LCDs are still a long way away from matching this natively and they're just terrible compared to CRTs, OLEDs, and plasmas in that regard. Now, of course, local dimming can kind of overcome that to a degree, but that has its own issues as well. But really, all my rambling here is just sort of a stream of consciousness. This is getting my thoughts out regarding the CRTs again. Having returned to this with the modern consoles, I am reminded just how stunning they can truly look. So with that in mind, let's sit back and enjoy some additional footage of the FW900 in action.
This has been the Digital Foundry CRT Montage, featuring a wide range of games on PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. So, as far as I see it, there are still three main use case scenarios for the CRT, and each is unique. Obviously, I do still feel that playing retro consoles is the primary reason you'd want to own a CRT today. In many cases, the artwork created for those games was designed to be viewed on such a display, and sometimes even using connections such as composite video. When you add in the quality of the motion, the lack of input latency and everything, it just becomes the best possible solution. And the best thing is that you don't necessarily need one of these high-end monitors to do it. Just any other consumer CRT will still provide a really nice, authentic experience. I do recommend this highly for anyone interested in classic consoles. The next use case is similar, and this focuses around retro computing. The thing about vintage computing is that a lot of the old resolutions and refresh rates used in classic games don't really work well on modern machines or with something like DOSBox, especially all those DOS Mode X games that run at 70 Hz. So for anyone that's an enthusiast of retro computing, I also highly recommend that you pick up a CRT and any old VGA monitor should do. Well, as long as you match it to the project that you're working on. The final use case then is what we've been focusing on in this video, that is using modern content on a CRT, but this one's a little bit trickier. I would be happy to play the PS5 or Series X on such a monitor. The lower resolution that you get when using this adapter is no big deal. It actually looks super, super clean and the pixel count just doesn't matter in the end. But at the same time, modern displays still have a lot to offer now, I have to admit. You know, HDR, overall brighter output, uh, large sizes, relatively lightweight, and just the lack of that huge casing that you get with a CRT. It's certainly not perfect, but I am happy to keep my uh, CX OLED here for sure. Which is why all of these displays sort of live in harmony together in my house. That's not feasible for everyone though, and I certainly would not suggest going out of your way to buy a display like the FW900 unless you actually have the room and desire to use it. If you do though, I really can't recommend it enough. It's a beautiful monitor and it's definitely worth still using. But that's gonna do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed this tour through the world of CRTs once again. And if you have any other questions, be sure to reach out and discuss with me. If you did enjoy it though, be sure to like, subscribe, ring the notification bell, and of course, follow us over on Twitter. But that's gonna do it for this video.